Is Israel's democracy at risk? It's a question many people are asking after the government announced a plan to overhaul the judicial system and weaken the Supreme Court. Over 100,000 people just protested against the plan in Tel Aviv and thousands more throughout Israel. And this is what it looked like. The plan has divided and shaken Israeli society. According to Barak Ravid of Axios, it has stoked fear that the heightened tensions could tear Israeli society apart. It's amazing, by the way, Yatedna Amman, Ma'ariv, and Haaretz all have very different political and religious bents, and they were all talking about how this would be the end of Israeli democracy. So let's take a step back and look at the bigger picture. What exactly is in these reforms? What is this crisis really about. And if this is the first you're hearing about this crisis, I'm going to break it down for you. And then I want to share with you three important messages that I think we can all learn from in this crisis, regardless of where we live. Okay, it's really important to explain this part because so often we love giving our opinions on things we don't fully get. Such a weird thing humans do. I probably do it all the time. Not a great habit. Okay, there are three main parts of the reforms and here they are briefly. Number one, the override clause. The reforms would significantly limit the court's power of judicial review. The way it is now, the Supreme Court can strike down any law it finds to be unconstitutional. Side note, kind of ironic because Israel has no constitution. Subject for another time. With the reforms, the Knesset would be able to override the court's decisions with a simple majority of 61 votes out of the 120 seat Knesset. Number two, reasonability test. The Supreme Court would no longer have the ability to make decisions on the grounds of reasonability. The court just used this earlier this month when it ruled that the appointment of Arye Derry as a minister was highly unreasonable due to his past criminal convictions. Also, the story of Arye Derry, that's a doozy. We'll get there one day. Leave a comment if you want me to address this history. It's fascinating. And number three, appointing judges. The reforms would also change how Supreme Court justices are selected and give the ruling coalition effective control of appointing them. That's what these reforms are. And regardless of what you think about them, whether you think it's a good idea or a bad idea, let's all agree this is a big deal. Those who support the reforms argue that the Israeli Supreme Court has grown overpowerful and that power needs to be shifted back to the Knesset. Justice Minister Yariv Levin, who announced the reforms earlier this month, said that the court's growing intervention in cabinet decisions and Knesset legislation had ruined public trust in the legal system and made it impossible for the ruling coalition to govern. Yonatan Green wrote that the reforms are a measured, justified, patently democratic response to decades of illegitimate judicial overreach, adding that they hardly warrant a collective panic attack. And on the other side, what do other people think? Opposition leader Yair Lapid described the plan as extreme regime change that would destroy democracy, while Benny Gantz accused Netanyahu's coalition of carrying out a constitutional coup. The Supreme Court President Esther Hayut predicted that the reforms would crush the judicial system and deal a fatal blow to democracy, while Aaron Barak said he was prepared to go before a firing squad if it would put an end to this drastic shakeup. Whoa, that is so dramatic. Those who oppose the reforms argue that by weakening the Supreme Court, they would remove the only check the system has on the power of the coalition. Esther Hayu explained it this way. The court is tasked with protecting human rights to ensure that the rule of the majority does not turn into the tyranny of the majority. And a recent poll by the Israel Democracy Institute found that a majority, 57%, of Israelis oppose the reforms. So which side is right? Are these reforms good or bad? I bet that's what you're wondering. I'm not going to tell you what to think. But here's how I see it. There are rarely only two sides to an issue. Usually there are arguments in between. Even if you oppose the reforms and think that they go too far, maybe it's true that Israel's Supreme Court does have too much power in the system. Or maybe it has just the right amount of power. It's okay to have a conversation about it. Let's resist the temptation to immediately side with either position just because of our political perspectives. We are not automatons, folks. So let's educate ourselves and think critically and rise above the noise with these three thoughts. Number one, let's avoid spiraling into doomsday scenarios. Whenever there is a problem in Israel, we can't say, this is a civil war, this is the end of Israel. Slow down, everyone. There is a historical context that really matters here. 
Do you know the story of the Alta Lane on 48 or German reparations in the 50s or Oslo in the mid 90s or Gush Katif in the early aughts? In each of these cases, people also said that it was the end of Israel. Some of the reactions we're hearing remind me of a famous essay by Simon Rabinowitz called The Ever Dying People. He pointed out that throughout history, the Jewish people have always lamented that our community is doomed, that our generation might be the last link in the long chain of tradition. I was thinking about it. He could have easily written the same essay about the ever dying Jewish state. The Jewish people are still here, folks. Israel's still here, and we're going to remain here. Without ever taking that for granted, let's check any impulse we have to say that this is the end of Israel. Number two, the debate is not about being pro-Israel or anti-Israel. Let's stop viewing it in those terms. It's amazing that over 100,000 people out there protested. That's like equal to over 5 million in America, by the way. That's a wonderful thing for a thriving democracy. You can live in Tel Aviv and oppose the reforms. You can live in Jerusalem and support them. Or you could be in either place and have the opposite perspective. It doesn't matter. The particular side you are on is not what determines whether you are pro-Israel. What does being pro-Israel even mean in a case like this? It's not a basketball team. Instead, let's talk about what it means to be a Zionist. To be a Zionist means to get up and do something. It means to be developers of the Jewish story, to be agents in our history and determine our future. The one thing I have an issue with is indifference. If you're a Jewish person and you care about the Jewish future, then get involved. Be part of the conversation and get your voice heard, no matter where you live. That's what 100,000 people did in Tel Aviv the other weekend. And number three, and this one is hard for me because I'm conflicted about it, but it's something I think about kind of often. If Israel needs to mirror your specific values in order for you to have an emotional attachment to it, then maybe you don't love Israel, maybe you love you. Of course, I always prefer for Israel to be aligned with my worldview, but guess what? Sometimes it doesn't. And yeah, it's hard. And guess what? I'm okay with that. I will debate that. I will question that. I will fight that. But no matter what, if Israel matters to me, my identity, I will engage with it. How about you?